Uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Uh, well, uh, this evening or this morning, uh, and, and a good morning to, to all of you uh, in, uh, in Fiji. Um, I will be giving a short introduction to the Copernicus program, uh, as well as um, uh, any kind of connection that the Pacific has with the, uh, the Copernicus program through the Copernicus networks. Um, so uh, Copernicus was born um, over 20 years ago, uh, but let's say it became operational uh, about eight years ago um, with the launch of the first services and the first satellites. And what is Copernicus exactly? Um, it's, it's really a flagship uh, program of the EU, not just the EU space program, but the EU in general. Um, it's the only assets that the European Union actually owns. So they own the satellites in, in, um, of the Copernicus program. And the aim of um, uh, Copernicus uh, in general um, uh, is to monitor the Earth, um, its climate, its environment, for example, um, to um, prepare and monitor disasters, uh, security risks, um, and to really um, make uh, yeah, uh, the EU uh, known as a global soft power, providing the right information at the right time. Um, for that reason, also um, the, the, the Sentinel satellite data of the Copernicus program and the Copernicus services are available under a full free and open data policy to anyone. So not just EU citizens, but really to anyone. And um, the, at, uh, um, you know, this was meant as a main driver for economic development and digital economy or digital transition in the EU. But of course, because of its availability of uh, um, full free and open data, um, this is really becoming something that's uh, uh, a, a potential tool for economic development everywhere. Um, and uh, I've mentioned already like the Sentinel satellites and the Copernicus services, and I'll go to a little bit deeper into that because it's a very broad range. Um, but perhaps what's perhaps good to know is so you, you have these satellites, um, uh, there are eight satellites in orbit now, for example, um, and derived uh, information services that have been uh, developed and that are made available for free and, uh, free and open. Um, so that any kind of commercial company, um, research institution, public uh, authority can use these data to develop downstream services that really suit themselves depending on the needs that they have. And um, uh, what's really important in Copernicus is that it was based on uh, user requirements. So on uh, the, they, they first went to check with, with public authorities, for example, um, to, to know or to understand what it is that they actually needed in terms of geospatial information to fulfill their reporting or their monitoring needs. And that then grew into the Copernicus Sentinels and then uh, that continues to grow into the next generation of uh, Copernicus Sentinels, but also into Copernicus services and the next generation of Copernicus services. Um, and um, to, to ensure that this uh, really remains a focus uh, is one of the reasons why the European Commission is the program manager of uh, the EU space program and Copernicus. Um, which, uh, you know, if, you, if you're familiar with the, the European environment, we have a European Space Agency and uh, ESA is very much involved into Copernicus. They're contributing, they're a partner in, in, the, in the program, but um, uh, uh, they, they do not manage um, because uh, the program is meant to be operational, not research. Uh, so what ESA does to support them is to build the satellites, for example, to operate the satellites together with UMITSAT, the um, European Agency for uh, Meteorological uh, Satellites, um, as well as provide additional uh, contributing missions, so very high resolution commercial data, for example. Um, then um, th that covers the space component. Uh, in terms of the services, um, the European Commission really went to the experts in those domains uh, that are covered. So for atmosphere, um, for climate, this was ESMWF, the European Center for Mid-Range Weather Forecasting. Uh, for um, uh, the marine environment, this is Mercator Océan, uh, who will be presenting uh, a little bit later today. For the land monitoring service, this was the European Environment Agency. Um, and so um, these services are really managed and, and operated by these experts um, 
to, to provide high quality data that people can trust on. And in addition to that, there's also an in situ component, which, uh, which means any kind of measurements that were made uh, on, the, on the ground in the sea, uh, for example. Uh, and uh, those data are not available um, to the public, but they do serve an important pur uh, purpose in creating uh, the services of uh, Copernicus. Um, so I've mentioned already the Copernicus space component, uh, which exists uh, for the moment of eight operational satellites, um, two Sentinel-1, two Sentinel-2, two Sentinel-3 uh, satellites, uh, the Sentinel-5P, so the precursor, pre precursor atmospheric satellite, um, as well as Sentinel-6, uh, which is an altimeter. Um, and uh, in, in the near future, we'll also have the launch of Sentinel-4 and Sentinel-5 uh, new uh, atmospheric uh, missions uh, in uh, cooperation with UMETSAT. Um, and so what do they, these mean to you, actually? Um, so Sentinel-1, um, for you, it, it, so it's a, a synthetic aperture radar, uh, which means that, um, you know, it, it doesn't look like a very pre pretty picture, um, but you can uh, derive really interesting information about it um, on, on, in terms of oil spills, in terms of flood detection and flood extent, um, with the benefit that it can see through clouds. So even if it's still raining um, a lot, uh, you can see through clouds and you can det uh, detect the extent of a flood, for example. Um, less important for you is, is, of course, icebergs or sea ice, but uh, also ground movement is, is uh, monitored at a millimeter scale with Sentinel-1. Sentinel-2 is the high-resolution optical satellite, um, which, um, you know, provides you with information on uh, land use, land cover, on agriculture, on forestry, so deforestation, afforestation, on uh, biodiversity, um, on the health of vegetation. Um, for mangrove monitoring, it's also used quite a lot for water quality, um, which can be very applicable to, uh, to Fiji and to the Pacific. Sentinel-3 is um, also an optical satellite, but looks at a much bigger area. Um, so it's... Uh, um, really meant for ocean forecasting, for environmental monitoring at a large scale, so at more at the, an ocean or a whole sea uh, kind of scale. Um, and then uh, Sentinel-5P is an atmospheric um, uh, mission, so it uh, monitors uh, trace uh, gases and aerosols uh, concentrations, um, which can be uh, really useful for um, detecting areas where there's a lot of pollution to see also where the pollution is moving to. And then Sentinel-6 is um, uh, really uh, interesting as well for the Pacific as it's a radar altimeter, uh, meaning it measures sea surface height, um, sea surface topography, uh, and can be very relevant in um, just uh, monitoring uh, sea, sea level rise uh, in supporting uh, climate change studies um, and uh, overall oceanography um, uh, studies as well. Um, so these uh, Sentinel satellite data are then used to derive additional information um, uh, in combination with models with in situ data. Um, there are six services, uh, the atmosphere monitoring service, the marine environment monitoring service, the land monitoring service, and the climate change service are free and open, so fully free and open. So all of the data and the, the geospatial data that are created there are available to uh, anyone who would like to use them. Um, also uh, on a global level. Um, the Copernicus Emergency Management Service is a, um, in a sense, a closed service because only specific um, uh, actors can request that uh, uh, for a uh, certain disaster, the service is activated, uh, but you'll hear more about it uh, later uh, today. Uh, and then the Copernicus Security Service is uh, focuses on um, maritime security on uh, border surveillance, for example, and that is a completely closed service. Uh, so you, you don't have access to the data. Um, it's really meant for, uh, for uh, European uh, security. Um, but uh, that doesn't mean that there's, there isn't a lot of data out there that you can use. Um, and for Copernicus Land Monitoring Service, for example, at the global level, uh, they're looking at um, land use, land cover maps with 100 meter resolution and an annual uh, um, revisit uh, rate. 
they look at energy balance, um, they look at uh, water quality in lakes, for example, um, the uh, several kinds of vegetation uh, phenology parameters. Um, and also, uh, you know, as, as a, um, a uh, inspiration of what can be done at a European level, there are also several higher resolution data that are derived from the Sentinel uh, satellite images, um, which give information about percentage of built up area, about uh, forests, about um, wetlands, for example. Uh, so all of these can be derived uh, using the, the Sentinel satellite data. The Marine Environment Monitoring Service, you'll hear more about in just a second. Um, but the idea there is that you can get um, daily analyses, forecasts, um, and as well as a long-term uh, archive going back in the past on sea level, on ocean um, biogeochemistry, on uh, uh, physical parameters of the ocean, on ocean currents, wind, for example. Um, uh, so all kinds of relevant parameters to see um, how how the ocean is is uh, moving, um, what is affecting the ocean, uh, how is climate change affecting the ocean, for example. The Atmosphere Monitoring Service also provides at a uh, global level uh, information about atmospheric quality, so uh, that is in trace gases, uh, greenhouse gases, for example, solar radiation, uh, UV indices uh, as well, um, and as well in, in the near uh, to the future or in the coming years, uh, a lot of information about emissions as well, so uh, CO2 emissions, um, surface fluxes, uh, which then feeds into, uh, for example, uh, climate change information. Um, so what the Copernicus Climate Change Service does is provide really high quality, reliable, robust information that can that is used, for example, into uh, the IPCC reports, into um, uh, providing essential climate variables that are uh, really consistent at a global level. Um, and in addition to that, not just monitoring our climate, but also um, supporting uh, any kind of uh, strategies for climate change mitigation, climate change adaptation, um, and uh, projecting the climate on a seasonal basis uh, and a, a little bit longer basis, um, which uh, is, is more and more becoming an essential service. And we also see that in a number of users of the service. And then finally, the Copernicus Emergency Management Service um, uh, can be really in of interest for you as well, because uh, while it is closed in the sense that not everyone can request that uh, a damage map is created, for example, after a disaster, um, uh, it is um, uh, open uh, or you can even, uh, it's, it's not only uh, open for EU, or EU actors, but also outside EU, um, the uh, emergency management service has provided uh, uh, risk and recovery maps um, to, to forecast towards the future, uh, but also rapid maps after, uh, after disasters. Um, and it also provides information that can be very useful um, for uh, global floods and global drought, droughts. Um, that uh, the, uh, to, to provide some more risk assessments. Um, uh, the second part of what I wanted to talk about is then, um, you know, you have all of these data, but uh, in order to make sure that they are, that they reach the right audience, uh, you need to have a whole user uptake mechanism. And that is where, um, you know, uh, ourselves as the Copernicus Support Office, together with the Copernicus Relays and the uh, Copernicus Academy, so the Copernicus Networks, uh, come in because we support the European Commission into um, uh, talking to the users, talking to the users really at a global level to exchange knowledge between the European Commission on what is happening in Copernicus and the users, the user base themselves to see what kind of feedback there is um, to uh, provide them with the right tools, the right uh, training information the, the, or uh, presentations, um, promotional material. Um, uh, newsletters, etc., so that uh, people, uh, our, our Copernicus network, networks have the right information to go and talk to a very broad audience and say like, okay, all of these data are, are available, but how, can you think of what you're going to do with it, for example? Um, and so to make a little bit of a, a difference uh, between the Copernicus Relays and the Copernicus Academy, the Copernicus Relays is really there to promote uh, in their local eco ecosystems um, Copernicus data and information, um, 
and that they usually they do that through the organization of uh, events. Uh, so for instance, uh, um, there uh, are Copernicus Relay in Fiji. Uh, Wolf, who is here today, um, uh, organized the Pacific Islands GIS and Remote Sensing User Conference in November last year, uh, where uh, the Co European Commission and the Copernicus Support Office uh, uh, supported. Um, uh, there are other events uh, taking place, but also hackathons, for example, are a very good way of reaching out to new audiences. And there was also cooperation between the Copernicus Relays to um, uh, uh, exchange uh, good practices. On the other hand, the Copernicus Academy um, is more focused on training the next generation of Copernicus experts um, to bring uh, Copernicus into research and to bridge the gap between research and commercialization. Um, and some of the ways that um, uh, this has been done already by our Copernic Copernicus Academy members is to organize an entire Copernicus master in digital earth, for example, but also several uh, massive, massive online open courses uh, or MOOCs um, that have been uh, uh, created uh, that show uh, the value of the, these uh, free and open uh, data. Um, of course, uh, while we have uh, some, uh, some very good relays uh, in uh, the Pacific, uh, you're, you're always uh, still welcome to join the networks. Uh, so uh, please go to our website, uh, uh, Copernicus.eu, and uh, have a look at the, the uh, application form. Um, and if there are any questions, we're always happy to help you uh, um, support at Copernicus.eu. Thank you very much.